Today we're going to be talking about abdominal trauma. Here's a great example of a penetrating abdominal trauma extreme case in which a obese gentleman jumped over a fence as he was doing something he shouldn't have been doing. The fence impaled him and the paramedics cut off the fence and took him in by actually a pickup truck. The whole concept here was not to remove the impaled object. This is obviously taken to an extreme. When we operated on him, he was so large that the impalement that you could see here basically had only gone through his fat, had not penetrated his abdominal cavity. Kind of a cool introductory case to our talk today. So again, I'm Chris Salvino. I'm the trauma director at Havasu Regional Medical Center. I'm going to be talking about abdominal trauma. We're going to go over case presentations and then an overview and some key points about abdominal trauma. So the first section is going to be some uh, cases that are going to have different key points to highlight. And before we get into it, I think this slide is probably the most important slide. The most common cause of hypotension from trauma is blood loss. The most common cause or the most common location of blood loss in a trauma victim is the abdominal cavity. And the most commonly injured organs that could lead to blood loss are the spleen and liver. So if someone is hypotensive, the first thing you should be thinking about is blood loss and the most ideal, I'm sorry, the most obvious location for this would be the abdominal cavity. Okay, here we go. Case presentations, case number one. This is a 29-year-old male with a stab wound to the left upper quadrant. In the field, he had a stab wound to the left upper quadrant. It was in the mid-clavicular line. He had stable vitals. His pulse was a little bit up. That could have been an early stage of stage one shock or he was just anxious, his skin was warm and dry, his lungs were clear, and he was transported to the trauma center. Upon arrival in the ER, the physical exam was similar to the field. As you look in the left upper quadrant on this, or I'm sorry, the, the upper part of the screen, you can see the arrow in the left upper quadrant. That's about the area of a stab wound. Now, we know it penetrated the abdominal cavity because I was able to put my finger in the wound, and it went inside his abdominal cavity, so it was a full penetration. There was a moderate amount of abdominal pain, and at this point, his vital signs were stable. He remained uh, warm and dry, and we took him, took him to CAT scan for a little more definition of the injury. Now, if this had been a gunshot wound as opposed to a stab wound, almost every gunshot wound that penetrates the abdominal cavity should go straight to surgery because the injury rate is so high with gunshot wounds. But with penetrating trauma from stab wounds, the chances of internal injury is markedly less. So therefore, you have a little more flexibility, so we opted to do a CT scan of the abdominal cavity, and on CAT scan, there appeared to be a splenic injury from the stab wound. However, the splenic injury did not appear to be bleeding. So we took a very stable stab wound to the left upper quadrant with a known CAT scan finding of a probable splenic injury to the OR, and we did something unusual. We did laparoscopic surgery. Normally, stab wounds and gunshot wounds go to the OR and have a large incision, which is an open exploration. In isolated, very unusual cases like this, laparoscopic evaluation can be done, and that's why we brought up this case today, because it's not an unusual way to do surgery. It's minimally invasive, so for stable patients akin, uh, the advantage is they were not going to end up with a big incision and a pain from that. So the findings at this time was a splenic injury near where the blood vessels go into the spleen, right down here, and it was not a repairable area, and we were uncomfortable leaving it this way. So basically the stab wound probably had transected the artery, caused a hematoma in this area, and stopped bleeding. But to just let that be uh, was kind of dangerous. It's not really a repairable injury. Plus the spleen is removable you can survive perfectly well without your spleen, so we elected to take the spleen out. And this also was done laparoscopically, which is also another unusual way to do trauma surgery, but a safe way. And in order to do that, we have to take off and transect the splenic artery. So this is a staple gun here. That's the splenic artery, which is similar to this graph here. And that stapler is transecting safely the splenic blood vessels, which then turns the spleen purple, it's no longer vascular, and then it could be removed in pieces through these holes. So this patient had an unusual presentation, stable, went to surgery, and we were able to actually successfully do his operation laparoscopically. 
From an outcome point of view, he did well in the hospital and was sent home on post-op day four, which is actually fairly quick. That was a pretty good case because it demonstrates that penetrating trauma, uh, when it does penetrate from stab wounds, does not always need to have an operation, unlike gunshot wounds. And when patients are stable, you have some choices. The next case was a, another uh, penetrating trauma case, but now this time with a rifle. This is a 32-year-old male who was doing target practice in the desert. The target was 100 feet away and was made of metal and wood. After he shot at the target, hitting the target, he found an immediate pain in his right groin and scrotum, and he heard a ping. So the assumption is there is a ricochet component here. Now, I think the important message here is that a gunshot wound going forward, the energy is pretty high, but once you hit the metal wood, the energy significantly dissipated, and the piece that bounced back, the energy of that would have been markedly less than the bullet leaving the gun. The weapon in, uh, in this case is an AK-74, which is a Russian assault rifle. It's the next generation to the AK-47. The bullet travels at 900 meters per second, which is a high-velocity assault rifle's type of speed. And it's designed to not necessarily kill someone. It's designed to tumble and deform, which would increase the cavitation wounds or the size of the wounds and maim the person. And that therefore, the uh, soldier would end up needing significant hospital care. And that actually costs more resources when you take it a live person that requires significant care as opposed to someone who's dead. So that's why this bullet was designed to tumble and deform. In the field, he had a physical exam showing a groin wound represented by this red dot right about there. It was a small wound. There was no other wounds noted. His vitals were stable, and he was transported to the ER. In our ER, there was a two millimeter wound in the right groin, the same spot that the paramedics had seen at the top of the scrotum. There was a suspicion of a deep wound due to the velocity of the foreign body, but when we did a, cat, a chest x-ray and pelvis x-ray, we saw no other bullets. So really, this was really a, a, a piece of shrapnel that came back and hit him. And his, again, vital signs in the emergency room were stable. So those are screening films basically designed to see if, by some unusual circumstance, it didn't end up just down here. Maybe the entire fragment had gone into his chest. The next step was to do a CAT scan. Again, we've had two cases with CAT scans from penetrating trauma, which the message there is that's not always the case. Normally with penetrating trauma, especially from gunshots, they go to surgery. But this, again, is an unusual case because it's more of a ricochet. So the CAT scan was done because he was stable, and it's an unusual presentation. And if you look closely, you can see a metal pellet right down here that's what ricocheted off the, the metal post and came back and hit him. It's probably one or two millimeters of a fragment. And it didn't go in that deep, but it's close to his testicle. So the next question was, is it possible that this fragment hit the artery that goes to his testicle? So an ultrasound of the testicle was performed, which is negative. So the flow of blood to the testicle is normal. So after all of that, he was discharged from the emergency room. And this is a great case because it demonstrates energy, energy dissipation. If that bullet would have hit him at the beginning before it hit the target, it probably would have ripped off his leg or caused significant damage, which is what that bullet was designed to do. In this case, what we're really dealing with is a ricochet injury of a fragment that by the time it, it came back and hit him, the energy was a very small fraction of what the original bullet's energy was. Okay, let's go on to case three. Now we're going to switch to blunt trauma. This is a 27-year-old male who is obese. He was being lifted up in a mosh pit with his friends. He was then dropped by, hopefully, accident into the pit, mosh pit and trampled. And then he was taken originally to a, an outside hospital in which he had stable vitals, but they found on CAT scan an extensive splenic injury, and therefore he was transferred to my trauma center. In the emergency room, his vitals were stable. He had no signs of clinical shock, and that his blood pressure was normal, and his pulse was normal. He was 325 pounds. 
He had mild to moderate left upper quadrant pain only. There was no peritoneal signs throughout the rest of his abdomen and no other injuries, and his blood count was normal. On CAT scan, um, the injury is actually pretty impressive. This is the liver here, and this is four different views of the abdominal cavity at the same time at just different levels. This is more at the top of the liver. This is more at the bottom down here. This is the top of the spleen, middle of the spleen, and bottom of the spleen. What you see here is this, this is the spleen, and the whiter area here, the, the, the lighter gray, is normal splenic tissue. This is the middle of the spleen with a big crack in it. This is blood, and this is blood behind the spleen. If you look over closely on this slice, that little white curly cue right there is active bleeding taking place right there. And down here, there's some active blush or bleeding, and the spleen is cracked physically almost in half. This appears to be normal spleen here and up here with a big crack in the middle. By the time it gets to the bottom of the spleen, the crack is not all the way through. You can see there's some spleen here. So this is what's considered a grade four splenic injury. The spleens are graded on a scale of one through four. I'm sorry, one through five, where one is a little scratch and five where it's blown to bits. So a grade four is a pretty bad splenic injury, and many times it requires surgery. So going back to this picture, since he was actively bleeding but stable, we took him to the angiography suite in which the interventional radiologist was able to do an angiogram and embolize the artery to the spleen, which means they actually put some material, which were six coils. Now these coils look like the springs in your pen, and they're about the same size. They put these coils in the splenic artery which stopped the blood flow in the splenic artery, which stopped the bleeding. So this is an embolization of the splenic artery. Now going back to this x-ray here again, with this active bleeding, the bleeding has to be stopped. It's either going to be stopped through an embolization or through surgery, and the big deciding factor is whether he's unstable or stable. If he was unstable at this point, he would have gone straight to surgery. But since he was stable, an embolization is an option. So that's why he went for an embolization, which is less invasive because it doesn't require a big operation. Now, how did he do? Well, initially he did well. He never required blood products. He remained stable. <clears throat> but by the uh, fourth day, his white count started to go up, which is a sign of infection or potential sign of infection. By the sixth through the tenth day after his admission, his temperature was up and his white blood cell count was up. Both of these things together are an indicator for possible infection. So we repeated the CAT scan, which is the CAT scan over here on the sixth day after his admission. And if you look closely, here's spleen, spleen, and these little black areas are air bubbles. Well, air bubbles inside fluid or tissue, especially in the fact of an elevated temperature and white count, typically mean an abscess cavity. Because in an abscess cavity, the bacteria can generate gas. Those are gas-performing or gas-producing bacteria, and they generate gas. And we waited a couple more days, and the gas was a little bit bigger. And we also... Uh, at the sixth day, took a sample that fluid through a needle. So he had an aspiration done, a CT aspiration, and the cultures came back about three days later showing a po gram-positive bacillus. So this person developed an infection of the spleen with a gram-positive bacillus, and then antibiotics were started. Now, why this happened, it's a little bit unclear. I've seen this happen a couple of times. It's possible it could come from the procedure itself. I've also seen this, again, happen four, five, six times in my career from different hospitals and different radiologists. So it's possible that when the splenic artery is embolized, there's no blood flow to the spleen, and there's blood back here where it's not supposed to be. So that's kind of like a Petri dish or a setup for an infection. So it's possible...
that he got an infection from the bacteria in his intestine that can actually get across the membranes into this tissue. So it's either came from the procedure itself or something called translocation of gut bacteria. Either way, he's got an infection that needs to be treated, and the way you treat an infection is at the minimum with antibiotics, and if it's a large collection of fluid that's infected, it requires drainage. So he uh, did well, and after two and a half weeks, his temperature was normal, his blood count, white blood cell count, was remained normal, and he was discharged home. So he was treated fairly well with just antibiotics, and when he came back six months later for a follow-up CAT scan, his spleen here is totally back to normal. It actually healed fairly well. So despite the infection and despite the prolonged hospital stay, this obese person uh, kept his spleen, and he also, was, he also got lucky that he did not need a formal operation. So it's a pretty interesting case of a splenic injury in a stable patient, the other teaching method is if we would have seen this initial CAT scan and he's unstable, he would have gone straight to surgery. Or in the emergency room, if he would have been unstable, we never would have gone to CAT scan, he would have gone straight to surgery. So at different stages of hospitalization, if someone's unstable, they typically go to surgery. And then if we go to case four, this is a 28-year-old female, motor vehicle accident, questionably restrained. Her, she was awake and orientated. Her blood pressure was normal, but her pulse was 120, and she had pain in the abdominal cavity. The implication here is possible uh, bleeding because the pulse is up. This would be the first stage of shock. If the pulse is up only, and they're bleeding at stage one shock, if the pulse is up and the blood pressure goes down, that would be stage the, the next stage of shock. By the time she got to the emergency room, her vitals were about the same. She was mild, mildly distended and she had abdominal pain. However, um, the lab tests came back, and they don't come back immediately. They came back a little bit later. Her hemoglobin is almost half of normal. Normal for a female should be 13 to 14.5, and she was 7.5. And on a blood gas that was drawn, she was acidotic, so low blood count, acidosis, distended abdomen, elevated pulse, abdominal pain, all point towards abdominal bleeding. She um, actually had a CAT scan because she stabilized, so part of the story is her blood pressure stayed the same. So we knew she was more than likely bleeding, but she would be considered something called a transient responder or something like that. She's somewhere between black and white on a scale what to do with her. If her blood pressure had dropped, we'd have gone straight to surgery. There's concern enough that we, at the minimum, need to do an x-ray or a CAT scan to see what her, her liver looks like and her spleen looks like. So again, I think the stressing point here, or the important point here, is there's a fair amount of concern, but her blood pressure had not yet dropped so she went to CAT scan. If her blood pressure had dropped, she would have gone straight to surgery. So anyways, we go from the ER, and remember, by the time we went to CAT scan, these lab tests were probably not yet back. So she goes to CAT scan, and we find a severe liver injury. I talked about the gradient of the spleens before. They are graded on a scale of 1 to 5. The same thing applies to livers and also kidneys, by the way. The scale of the injury for blunt trauma is 1 through 5. One is like a scratch, and five would be where the spleen, liver, or kidney are basically blown to bits. She was a four plus, so she's a pretty bad injury. That mortality rate is about 20% or greater. Here is um, a picture of the top of her liver showing some what appears to be active bleeding in her liver. This white stuff is more than likely some blushing or active bleeding, and this is more normal liver-colored tissue. This is her heart over here. So the concern here is this. And because we have a pulse of 120, these lab tests we came back, the, the liver looked like it was actively bleeding, and then from CAT scan, she dropped her blood pressure a little bit. She's becoming a little unstable. So to go to angiography for embolization is not prudent. So the next step would be the OR. So 
This person differs from the gentleman I just presented who had the splenic injury in that he remains stable, but he was bleeding, so to go to angiography is a safe procedure. She is unstable or transient at best, and so when she dropped her pressure, going to angiography was not an option, so we went straight to surgery. So in the operating room, the findings were the severe liver injury that we found. There was a big tear at the top of her liver. We actually put glue up there called fibrin glue, which is a natural glue. We applied that to the surface and packed it, and the bleeding stopped. So as far as her hospital course goes, because we got to surgery fairly quickly and she had not needed a lot of blood products prior, the total amount of blood used during her hospital course is about four units initially. And then she stayed in the hospital because of her liver injury, which is pretty severe, <clears throat> about 35 days. And she developed one unusual re-bleeding episode about one month into her hospitalization. So the farther out you go, the less chance of bleeding. By the time you get out to about 10 days out from an injury like this, the chance of bleeding is pretty small, and she broke the odds because she did bleed at about one month out. Luckily, she was still in the hospital. She was uh, discharged home uh, a, a, a bit later, and she was discharged home for 24-hour adult supervision for the next 30 days. So when she finally did go home, she stayed at home with adult supervision for 30 days because if she would have passed out at home, implying another bleeding episode, then having an adult around, they could have called 911. Uh, in the clinic, I saw her a couple of times. She did well, and she was supposed to have a CAT scan of her liver every three or four months to see how the liver was healing, and we would predict that she'd have complete or near complete resolution of her liver injury about six months out. So we've had um, two good cases just showing active bleeding, one with a spleen and stable patient that developed a complication of an infection but did well. And this one became somewhat unstable, requiring surgery, but ultimately did well. So with those four cases as a lead, and we're going to go over abdominal trauma and try to hit some highlights here. This is a great example of my favorite equation, which is mass times velocity squared, which is the kinetic the kinetic energy formula. So the kinetic energy formula applies to blunt trauma, car accidents, ATV accidents, boating accidents, falls off of bridges. It applies to penetrating trauma. And the energy from the object, whether it's a car or the bullet, is the mass of the object times the velocity squared. So the most important thing in any kind of trauma is the velocity of what's taking place. In this case, this car was traveling at significant speed imparting significant energy to the side of the vehicle, basically almost cutting the vehicle in half due to the velocity probably going more than 70 miles an hour. So, lead in slide. Abdominal trauma, which is, which is this topic it's going to be about, it often goes unrecognized. It's the second leading cause of death. It can be difficult to determine the damage internally, especially in the field without imaging and massive blood loss can lead to shock and death fairly rapidly. The abdominal area is divided really into multiple different compartments, so it's not just one compartment. The biggest differential is the peritoneal cavity, which is what you think of as the abdomen, and the retroperitoneal space, which is what you think of as the back of the abdomen. These two areas do not connect. If you look at a pretty cool schematic here, the um, lower torso is divided into three compartments, as I mentioned in the prior slide. First off, this is the chest proper. This is zone one of the torso, zone two, and zone three. So one, two, and three. They're different in basically in their, in their um, bony protection. Zone one is still part of the chest itself, and it has abdominal organs protected by the ribs. Zone 2 has no real bony protection except for the spine, so all the organs in here, which is mainly intestines, are, are vulnerable to damage. And then Zone 3 is the pelvis, and these organs down here 
are protected by the bony structures of the pelvis. So we're going to go by each of the different cavities. The upper cavity, again, is the upper peritoneal cavity encased by the ribs, and that includes the liver and spleen, which are two of the most frequent organs that are damaged that cause bleeding, along with the diaphragm, stomach, and transverse colon. The middle one, or the lower peritoneal cavity, consists of no bony structures, and it mainly consists of uh, colon, small bowel, and part of the stomach, so hollow organs. And then the pelvic cavity down here is, again, encased by the bony pelvis. It contains the rectum, bladder, and the reproductive organs. Those three cavities do connect to each other, but the next one, the retroperitoneal space, does not. And those have very dangerous structures, the aorta in red and the vena cava, bringing blood back to the heart back here, plus the kidneys and some other structures. If any of these are damaged and cause bleeding, that may not actually go into the abdominal cavity. It just may cause a huge hematoma in the back. So again, the retroperitoneal space and the abdominal cavity are separated despite the fact that they look like they're connected. There is a veil of tissue over them, which can normally keep the two compartments separate. A mechanism of injury is important. That's why um, the trauma surgeons and ER physicians really need to work well, and the, and the nurses need to work well with the pre-hospital providers because it's important to know the mechanism of injury, such as where was the force vector? Did it come from the front or the side? Along with speed and other pieces of information, because we might actually uh, dictate our workup based on this. For example, someone going 100 miles an hour into another car at 50 miles an hour more than likely is going to need a lot more CAT scans than someone going 10 miles an hour. Someone hit from the front might get a different type of workup than someone hit from the side. And then, so let's break this down a bit more. This particular slide talks about mechanism. A direct blow would be like a steering wheel or a door or a floor hitting you directly. Uh, deceleration injury is a little bit different, and that's when one part of your body moves against something and one part does not. For example, if you are wearing a lap belt, which is a protective device and good for you, the lap belt is going to immediately stop your skin from moving but your liver inside your abdominal cavity is going to keep moving a little bit because it's not fixed against the lap belt. So that can have a, a second injury despite the lap belt. Penetrating trauma, uh, the big difference here from, from stab wounds to low velocity gunshot wounds to high velocity assault rifles, the, the huge difference here is velocity. So stab wounds have energy to them because there's energy and there's a velocity to the, to the actual stabbing itself. But the energy is so small that the, the energy that goes around the stab wound is basically minimal. So the only real injury from a stab wound is exactly where the knife cut goes. If you jump down to a, the high velocity bullets coming out of an assault rifle, those bullets are going so fast they create a cone of energy cone of energy called a cavitation wave around the bullet itself. So the bullet may only be a half centimeter in diameter, but the cavitation could be almost up, upwards of a foot. And a handgun would be somewhere in between. It still has energy nowhere near as much as a high velocity bullet. So its cone of, in its cone of injury may be only a couple centimeters. Here's that formula I was telling you about before, my favorite formula. The kinetic energy formula is mv squared. And again, as we hinted at before, the most important part of the equation is the velocity over the mass. And again, it's important to understand kinetic energy as a whole, whether you're working in the field or the ER, and also how it applies to trauma. And I'll give you an example how it applies to us in particular out in the rural area of Arizona, and that has to do with highways. So let's look at um, Interstate 95, which is a undivided highway, versus Interstate 17 in Phoenix, in which the highway is divided. So if, if you look at the example to the right, um, if you are going on uh, Interstate 95, 
in which it's undivided and you're going 50 miles an hour, you can easily hit another car head on at 50 miles an hour going towards you. The combined velocity is 100 miles an hour, but the energy is four times more. So if you were to hit, let's say you're going on 95 and you hit a wall at 50 miles an hour, the kinetic energy would be the mass times the 50 miles an hour squared. If you're if you were going 50 miles an hour and you hit a head-on car accident at another 50 miles an hour, the velocity squared brings the energy up to 400 times more. So head-on collisions are significantly higher in kinetic energy than someone striking a wall. Now, that compares to Interstate 17 in that you cannot have a head-on collision on 17 because there's a divided wall. So by math alone, Undivided highways are much more unsafe than a divided highway because you cannot get in a head-on collision on a divided highway. So with abdominal trauma, treatment in general is ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. If you suspect blood loss, oxygenation helps deliver the oxygen to the tissues to maximize what blood you have left. You would start inter intravenous fluids. However, there's controversy about this because... Some people believe you should get a couple liters of fluid, and some people believe you shouldn't give any fluid unless they're very hypotensive. Here's the rationale. Let's say you have a liver injury, and you start bleeding. The bleeding causes you to get hypotension. The hypotension stops the bleeding because your blood pressure is low, causing a clot. Well, then you probably want that blood pressure like at 80 as opposed to giving more fluids because... Some people think if you have that bleeding that drops your blood pressure, clot forms, and then give it, if you give two liters bolus of saline, you can blow that clot off and start the bleeding all over again. So the intravenous fluid issue is controversial whether you give any, some, or a lot in what type of fluids. So for the purpose of this conversation, just be aware there's a lot of different angles here, and I think since there's so much controversy, there's no right answer. If someone has ongoing blood loss, like the couple of cases that we just sh showed you, if they are stable, they can go to angiography. If they are unstable, they only go to surgery. Now let's talk about some unusual things. If you have evisceration of the abdominal contents, like the small ball sticking out of a wound, or an impaled object, those people need to go to surgery. If you have an evis evisceration, the only treatment you should do in the field or the ER is to cover that with a uh, warm, moist, still dressing and not, try to, not to try to push that back into the wound. If you have an impelled object, now the example I gave you is a little unusual. I had another case in which a kid tried to um, commit suicide by putting a bow and arrow in his mouth and firing it, and it ended up transecting part of his spinal cord. That was left in his mouth until he got to surgery. This, again, the fluid controversy I've kind of already gone over. There are studies to support some fluids or too much fluids, and then there's some fluids to, to or some, some people who talk about what type of fluids, whether you get blood products, normal saline, lactated ringers, or hypertonic fluids. So, again, we're just going to leave this at the fact that there is a fluid controversy that has still yet to be resolved. On physical exam, one key point that I really would like as a take-home message is that blood by itself doesn't really hurt. That's important because if you do an abdominal exam and you say that the person has no abdominal pain, that doesn't necessarily mean they have, are not bleeding. So here's some examples. Let's say someone got uh, hit by a car accident to the abdominal cavity and they have left upper quadrant pain and they broke ribs and they're also bleeding. Well, the pain's probably coming from the broken ribs. Or... Same patient comes in with no broken ribs, with left upper quadrant pain, and has a splenic rupture. If they have a hematoma around the spleen, that hematoma may more than likely push against the peritoneal cavity, the lining of the peritoneum. The lining has nerve endings, <clears throat> so that person probably feels that. Now, a similar patient comes in a car accident. They did not break ribs, and... They um, don't have a hematoma on the spleen, but the spleen is actively bleeding into the abdominal cavity. 
that person might feel a little sore, but they're not going to have massive pain like acid type of pain. So again, it's important to recognize the fact that active bleeding does not necessarily hurt, especially if you compound that with alcohol. A lot of people come in, they're drunk, they have no abdominal pain, the mistake is made that therefore they can't have any kind of injury abdominal injury, and a CAT scan is done later showing active bleeding. The next thing there is listening to the abdominal cavity, which they teach in every textbook, is not that helpful in the acute trauma situation. It's not really going to tell you much. And by the way, there's only one abdominal compartment. So you could, some textbooks teach to listen in four different parts of the abdominal cavity, but it's basically one compartment and sound travels. So if you really are bored and you want to listen, there's no reason to listen in four places, just listen in one. Percussion is not that helpful either. These are things that probably go back 40, 50 years before the advent of CAT scans and good ultrasounds. Um, this slide is specifically has to do with someone who's had surgery from trauma or general surgery, and it has to do with their incision. If you have someone with an incision in the middle part of your abdominal cavity, after surgery, that incision is going to hurt. So the nurses and physicians should pretty much stay away from touching the incision because it's going to hurt. If you're going to be evaluating the abdominal cavity after surgery, <clears throat> you really should be evaluating for, for complications such as peritonitis. And you can easily do that by pushing on the peritoneal cavity away from the incision. Vital signs, and we had a couple patients earlier in our examples in which we referenced vital signs and blood pressures and pulses. So if you have um, uh, ongoing blood loss, as the blood loss gets worse, the first vitals that will change will be the heart rate, which will go up. As it worsens, the blood pressure will go down. As you get into severe shock, your respiratory rate will then also go up. The unusual thing that throws people off is someone who has some sort of heart problem, could be an elderly person, and they're on a beta blocker, and in that case, the heart rate's not going to go up because it's artificially being suppressed. So be careful of those patients. <clears throat> now, evaluation tools. The hemoglobin um, is probably the most important here because it can give you a trend in blood loss. The initial hemoglobin can be a fooler because it takes time for the blood count to drop. So if someone has a really bad car accident and a liver injury two miles from the hospital, it's very probable that their hemoglobin will be virtually normal. An hour later, it could be down to seven, like that one lady I showed you. So the hemoglobin is useful in context. When was the hemoglobin drawn? And sometimes it's nice to have serial hemoglobins. Other tools for evaluation is an older tool called a DPL, or Diagnostic Perineal Lavage, which is not used that often, but still a tool. Basically, a needle and a catheter is placed in the abdominal cavity. A liter of saline is put into the abdominal cavity and then drained out through that incision or through that catheter, sort of like siphoning gas out of your car. That can tell us if there's significant bleeding in the abdominal cavity by looking at the color and the intensity of the blood in the, in the liquid. The FAST exam is an ultrasound of the abdominal cavity, which is done whether the patient is stable or, or unstable. The downside is it's not that accurate, and you can miss injuries, especially in an obese person, and it cannot find a retroperal in, retroperitoneal injury easily. CAT scans are probably the gold standard for evaluating the abdominal cavity, but should not be used in someone who's unstable. The other evaluating tool, which is kind of a tool, but not quite, which I did not put up there, would be the operating room. If someone is unstable and they, you suspect an abdominal injury, you don't need any of these things to go straight to surgery. An example would be a gunshot to the abdominal cavity. Uh, they're more than likely have a 95% chance or higher that they have internal injuries. So normally going to CAT scan is not helpful or doing any other test would not be helpful. They're best off in surgery where you can evaluate for injuries. <clears throat> antibiotics. In blunt trauma that goes to surgery, typically we give one dose of antibiotics, but in blunt trauma that does not need surgery, 
They don't need any antibiotics typically. Penetrating trauma, typically antibiotics are given fairly quickly and then for one or two days at the most. This slide kind of brings home some of the things we talked about during the case presentations, plus some of the initial slides about management. So if you suspect blunt injury to the spleen, liver, or kidney, those have a high chance of bleeding. If the patient is unstable, they go to surgery. Basically, anybody that's unstable can and should be taken care of in the operating room. If the patient is stable and they're actively bleeding, let's say they're stable and they go to CAT scan and they're bleeding, then they can go for embolization observation. If the patient is stable, they're not bleeding, and they have an injury, they would be observed. So let's do a couple quick examples. Patient comes in with a blood pressure of 60 from blunt car accident. That's not stable. They would go straight to surgery. Patient is um, in the emergency room with blood pressure 120 over 80. After a car accident with abdominal pain, they would go to CAT scan. In that example, that CAT scan showed a liver injury. That's not bleeding. Like a grade 3, they could be observed. Same patient so shows a grade 3 liver injury that is actively bleeding, and they are stable. They need to go have that embolized. If you don't embolize it, there's a good chance they will become unstable, and then you're going to be in surgery. So in summary, from an abdominal trauma point of view, the most common cause of hypotension in a trauma patient is blood loss from the abdominal cavity. So whenever you see someone who's been in an accident, of any kind who's hypotensive, think about blood loss. That's the number one reason why they'd be hypotension, hypotensive. And the most common area is the abdominal cavity, with liver and spleen being the main reason why they might be hypotensive. On this bullet point, the take home message here is the most common injury to the abdominal cavity from blunt trauma would be injury to the liver or spleen, which bleeds. From penetrating trauma, because there's so much intestine, whether it's small bowel, colon, or stomach, the most commonly injured organs from penetrating trauma is the hollow viscous. This is probably going to drive home the treatment algorithm. If anybody who's got an injury from the spleen, liver, kidney, or other injuries is unstable, they go straight to surgery. If they are stable and they're actively bleeding, they need to be embolized. If they're not bleeding, they could be observed. And again, finally, the last two bullet point take-home messages that is that bleeding does not necessarily hurt. That is a fallacy to think that someone with no abdominal pain could not, not be bleeding, So, especially in someone who's been drinking. And finally, the first sign of shock is the elevation of the heart rate in a normal person. Mm -hmm. And that concludes our uh, abdominal trauma lecture. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Is that a take? Yes. <laughs> Just like in Vegas. I don't, I don't know. Are we doing another one with the spine tunnel and being done here?